going live. Hey y'all, I'm James Wright and welcome to my shop. Tonight we are going to be answering all of the greatest arguments in the woodworking world and tonight we will be definitively answering all of them so that all arguments can stop and I brought in a ringer to answer these so that we can have the absolute definitive truth and know what is the best when it comes to all of these problems and our, our, we can answer it down here. Oh, no, not, not her. Um, Magic 8 Ball. Yeah, that'll, that'll do it. Um. <laughs> Welcome to Wood by Right. It's a fun time. If you are new to our lives, uh, we do them every Tuesday at 8 p.m. Central Time. And uh, we're, we brought on all sorts of different topics uh, each week. So uh, if you want to hop in on those, if you're watching this recorded, then go down in the description. And I have a whole bunch of all the questions down below, um, all of the things we are talking through. And each one of them has a timestamp beside it. So you can roughly get to where you want to be um, for that. So um, if you want to do that, if you are here um, live, then go ahead and throw your chats in the, the chat that is scrolling by. And uh, we'll, we'll try and get to as many of these arguments as we can tonight. Um, yeah, this one's going to be a fun one. Uh, the, uh, we're, yeah, arguments are always like... I'm a little disappointed. What? You don't have mom jokes greater than dad jokes or dad jokes greater than mom jokes as a controversy. <laughs> well, it's not a controversy. Mom jokes are better. Okay, thank you. Dad jokes are groans. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> yes. Um, uh, upcoming events. <laughs> we just got the invite in the mail today for the MWTCA uh, for the national meet. So if you are a member of the MWTCA, you should have gotten an email today for that. Uh, the national meet is going to be in Gettysburg, Pennsylvania, June 15th through the 18th. Don't quote me on that. Um, and I'm going to be there. I'm going to be flying out, so I'm really, really looking forward to that. Uh, if you don't want, if you don't know what it is, uh, the MWTCA national meets are the largest hand tool sales in the entire world. Uh, they usually happen twice a year, barring COVID. <laughs> and uh, on Thursday, there is a tool sale early in the morning. Usually, as soon as the sun rises, uh, the whole parking lot is full of trucks that have tools being sold out of the back of them and it is called the tailgate sale um, and it is probably one of the most cost efficient ways to buy tools uh, in the united states that you can easily find them other than you know going to all of the garage sales and, and flea markets and things like that uh, and so that's thursday morning uh, usually not the best quality tools or the really collectible ones but the good users that you can restore and get up and really good prices. That, that's my, one of my favorite sales. Then Friday, it moves inside. Imagine a basketball court completely covered with tables and every table is completely covered with tools and underneath every table is completely covered with tools and all of them are for sale and it's just heaven. Um, yeah, that's the, the national meet. That's Friday and then whatever's left over on Saturday is then sold. Usually there's a little bit better deals. People are willing to sell more because they don't want to have to carry it out to their car. Um, so that is the MWTCA meet. Um, yeah, it's only open to members. You have to be a member to go and then you have to pay the conference fee to get in. Um, so it does cost some, but it is well worth it for the whole event. And there's a bunch of other things with talks and uh, um, tours that you can go do and dinners. And um, it's a good time to meet with other people who collect tools and just learn about the history of tools. It's a fantastic place that. So if you can't tell, I'm excited. I'm looking forward to meeting some of you there. Um, but on with that, let's uh, let's move on to the main topic. So uh, we're going to start with the, the biggest classic of all of them. I'm writing times down here. so that, uh, <laughs> James, what? take a breath. Oh, do I have something I need to say? No, you're getting faster and faster. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I'm getting excited. Can you tell? <laughs> I love arguments. <laughs> Notice he didn't specify winning or losing them. <laughs> I always win them. This is the way we are. <laughs> Maybe in certain other groups. Oh, Alan, thank you. Mom jokes. Oh, gosh. You ready for it? Or should uh, I hang move on? on one second. Oh, okay. She's got it. So for those I who wasn't know, ready. Alan, I, for anyone you've who's been gone. Cats, you I'm not as joke. prepared. Should I do it or? Go ahead. And okay. I'll find the, it. the granddaddy of all woodworking arguments is which comes first, pins or tails? Uh, and this is one of those topics where, I, yeah, I don't know why this one brings up so many arguments, but it really, really does. Um, and as with most of the arguments, in the end, um, it's 
tails. You, you do tails correctly. Um, the next one then is bevel up versus bevel down planes. And of course, bevel up, those are better. Uh, let's see, uh, tenons first or mortises first? That's a really, really easy one. You always do your tenons first. Uh, what's next? Um, what's the best steel, A1 or O2? Um, of course, it's PMV11. Um, push or pull saws? Which one is the better one? Of course, it's push saws. That one's just an obvious one. Uh, let's see, um, strops or really high grit stones? Strops, and particularly ones purchased on woodbyright.com. Uh, let's see, oil versus water stones versus diamond stones versus sandpaper. Um, diamonds are a woodworker's best friend. And what's the purpose of the nib on the saw? There is no purpose. Um, and uh, plane, oh, do you rest a plane on its side or on its sole? You rest it on its sole. There, we've answered all those questions. I hope you all like this and thank you for coming. Uh, we'll see you all next week. Or should I answer this a little better? <laughs> <laughs> oh, we had more super chats. <laughs> yes. Do you have a mom joke before I actually start this thing? <laughs> right. yeah. For those of you who don't know, um, yeah, that's not how things work around here. Um, <laughs> we, the, the, the answer to all of these is it depends. Uh, there is no right or wrong. And that's one of the things about woodworking is that it doesn't matter how you do it, as long as you do it safely, there are a thousand different ways to skin every cat. And man, I love skinning cats. So be willing to try new things and do different things. But tonight I actually wanna go through these and explain what are the differences and what telltales might be to show which may, way may be better for you. So All what's right. the mom joke? Okay, I'm gonna start with one because there's a whole bunch of things I'm missing in the chat. If slow old men use walking sticks, what do fast old men use? What? Curry canes. <laughs> Curry canes. I like that. That's a good one. So, um, tails versus pins. Uh, I generally cut tails first. And the reason I do that is because it makes it very easy to gang cut them. I can put a bunch of them together and I can cut all my tails at once, or at least half of my tails, then flip the boards over and cut the other half of the tails. That way they all match. Um, and it works out really, really well to do that. And then it's much, much easier to transfer the marks from the tails to the pins than it is from the pins to the tails. Uh, if you do it from the pins to the tails, there's a little bit more of a work because you have to get into that window to get down in there. However, it's a little easier to cut the pins first if you, because whichever one you cut first doesn't really matter. If you cut the tails first, it doesn't matter. If you cut the pins first, it doesn't matter. So if you want to cut one or the other, it's easier to cut the pins first than it is to cut the tails. It's much easier to follow a line on the tails that would be created from the pins. So it's kind of one of those things of uh, six of one half dozen of another. It, really, there isn't a personality type that's more to one or the other. Um, if, you, if you follow, um, oh, come on, uh, Klaus, Frank Klaus. Uh, Frank Klaus? Oh, I'm drawing a blank on it. Frank, Frank, Frank Klaus, yeah, yeah. Uh, he cuts pins first, and he cuts dovetails like no one's business. He doesn't lay anything out. He doesn't mark anything. He just cuts them by eyeball, and it's amazing, and he cuts pins first. Does an amazing job with that. Um, Paul Sellers cuts tails first. Um, it's one of those things where you're really not going to mess it up one way or the other. Find the way that works your, your way. Try both. Experiment with them. And even, even with that, that's not just two different ways of doing it. Each one, there are ways of doing it. There are a hundred different ways of laying out each of them. So experiment, play with it. There is no right or wrong, and everyone's gonna find something that they like that works well for them. What's the, uh, the missing? Well, first, let's go to Aaron's question because he super chatted. Okay. And it is, what is the best size for a smoother for a grown man sized hand? <sighs> yeah, smooth and plain, that's a good one. Um, Smoothing, uh, traditionally, historically, the number four is the smoothing plane. That's the size that is close to an average coughing, coffin plane, which had been around for hundreds of years. Uh, the, 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 I think an average, most people are going to like the number four most for smoothing. However, the four and a half and the three are often very, very closely tied for smoothing. If you are the type of person where you really cherish that perfectly flat, clean, smooth surface, you're probably gonna like a number four. Because it's bigger, it means you're gonna end up flattening a larger area if you just have to do a spot cleanup. 
If you just need to do spot, spot cleanups, you can come in with a number three and hit one little area much, much easier. But you're going to end up with a little bit more of a depression. Whereas if you have a number four, that depression is, is not noticeable in any way. It, it's much, much bigger. Uh, so if that's something that really annoys you, the number four is good. It is very beneficial in that it will do a wider area in a single pass, so it's more efficient. But that means more force going into it. Whereas the number three is much lighter and easier to push. Um, so you're going to have to do more passes, but every pass is going to take less energy. Is one better than the other? No, it just kind of comes down to personal preference. And that's why generally the number four is looked at as the, the quintessential smoother because it's the middle ground. And most of the time, if it's A or B, the answer is usually C. Um, and so number four is the most common um, that you'll see for a smoother. So good question, Aaron. Do you have a mom joke ready? I do. Make sure I'm going to leave these out. What's that? Um, sorry. What? It's more of a pun than a joke. So I'm trying to figure out the delivery on the live. <laughs> <laughs> Here you go. Ready? Okay. I overdosed on anti-anxiety medications a few minutes ago, but it's okay. You know why? Why? I'm not too worried about it. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's a good one. It like takes it. a moment. It, that that one's for you. I like it. <laughs> Are you saying I need anti-anxiety meds? <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, okay, next one. Here's a big one. Bevel up versus bevel down. A low angle bevel up plane. Uh, let me make sure I write this down. Um, there are pros and cons to each. The bevel up low angle plane takes less force to push through it because it is more in line with the force. Um, it does have a little bit lower of an actual cutting angle. Um, and so that means that it is going to move through the work a lot easier. Um, it also has less parts to it, so it's easier to set up. Um, they do tend to be about the same weight though some people will say one weighs a little less than the other. Um, this also generally has the movable mouth, so it's easier to do that. If you want to switch from one method to another, you usually have a set of irons that you can put in there. You have a high angle iron and you have a low angle iron, and that's how it does its adjustments. The nice thing about this is there are a thousand different ways you can set up this plane, moving the frog and moving all the pieces, and this has far more adjustability to it without having to switch the irons. Um, but when it comes down to it, this one's going to take a little bit more skill. Uh, it's a little bit more finicky to set up. So if you are new, generally go with the bevel up plane. If you have been in it for a while, well, then you probably know what you want. Um, but if you're the type of person where you like to really set things up and get the jig going, um, the bevel up plane is going to give you a little bit more flexibility. Now, both of these are going to do 99.9% .9 of anything out there. This is going to be better at end grain cutting. The low angle uh, inline iron is going to cut better on the end grain. That doesn't mean you can't cut end grain with this, but you're going to have to do more work to set this up. This has got to be set up within an inch of its life. It's got a really sharp edge, but it will do the exact same thing. Um, when it comes to really difficult figured wood, this, <sighs> most of the time, you can get this to work. You can close up the mouth, put a high angle, um, a high angle iron on it, and you can get through most all um, figured wood with that. Uh, I've had a few times where it, that still doesn't cut it. And in that case, this is usually where I'm going to go. This will be able to go a little bit more figured wood. Um, but usually when I get to that point in figured wood, I'm going to grab a card scraper. So in all reality, it doesn't matter. Um, if you are new, you're probably going to like this a little bit more. Um, if you are far more into the hand tool world, you're probably going to like this a little bit more. But they both work well. And as to every topic I'm talking about here, I probably have an entire video dedicated to each one of these. So if you want to go into deeper, um, you can look this up. Uh, let's see. Tenons versus mortises. I've had a bunch of questions about this one recently. Uh, because historically, if you look at most of the teaching curriculums from shop classes, they will teach you to cut the mortise first and then make the tenon to fit the mortise. Um, and that works great. It really doesn't matter which one. They, they both do it. There's pros and cons to both. The idea is if you cut the mortise, it's easier to adjust the tenon 
to fit the mortise because it's out here, whereas adjusting this is a little bit more difficult. But the idea is if you cut the tenon first, it's far easier to transfer the marks from the tenon onto the mortise. Um, so it's kind of one of those six of one head does another. Though I do find the argument of it's easier to adjust the tenon than the mortise kind of superfluous because if this is already in the vise and you're checking it, it really isn't that hard at all to adjust it. It takes the exact same work, just different tools. Um, so generally, I cut the tenon first, and you're going to find that most um, all hand tool people cut the tenon first, but um, historically in looking at the shop classes, not historically in looking at uh, ancient times, but historically in shop classes, you're going to find most people prefer to cut the mortise first. Is one better than the other? No. As long as they both fit, that's what matters. Um, if I'm talking, if there's something I have to say, let me know. I'm going to jump in. So I got a bunch of these to hit. Uh, I mean, I have questions, but... Uh, okay, well, let me, I'm going to get through these then. Uh, what's the best woodworking steel? Um, usually the argument comes up between O1 and A2. Um, and really, there are they're, they're two kind of ends to the spectrum. Um, O1 is a little bit softer. It's a little bit more forgiving. It's an easier wood to work with. It's e easier steel to harden. Um, and so if you're going to be doing the hardening yourself, O1 is very, very um, sedate. The problem with O1 is it dulls a little faster. Uh, so you're going to end up sharpening it more. But it sharpens easier. And so if you're a beginner, I would say go with O1. It's easier to harden it. It's easier to work with it. It's easier to sharpen with it. You're going to have to sharpen it more often, but that's okay. You're learning, and so that's actually a good thing. Whereas A2 tends to be a bit harder. Um, it, it tends to be uh, far more resilient. It will last longer. It will give you a, a more resilient edge if it's hardened well, but it is difficult to harden. It's one of those tools that's a little bit more temperamental. Um, and that being said, it takes a little bit more to sharpen it. It's one of those things, if you're working with a, a cheap sandpaper, uh, it's, it's a little slower and you'll, you'll notice that you're at it for a while and if you have to reprofile something, it takes a long time. Um, so it's one of those things, if you really want a really good edge, then that's that. Um, in a lot of the testing I've done, because I've tested, I want to say it was 22, probably way off of the number, um, plain irons. And I tested everything that's on the market within reason. Um, and I found that the average distant difference between A1 and O2 is kind of negligible. Um, PMV11 was much better. Um, I mean, not, not much better, but it was significantly better and about as easy. And so it was kind of like the, the best of both worlds. It lasted longer and was relatively easy to sharpen. Um, but then you can get into some of the other wild things like some of the Japanese steels, and I, I tested a few of those. Um, and there are some carbides. Carbides are really cool. They last a long, long time, like three to four times as long. The problem is in order to sharpen them, you have to have diamonds. You can kind of do it on some of the oxide sandpapers, but um, they still take forever and you're going to burn through a lot of sandpaper. So those are one of the things that, that, that they're kind of downside. Um, but as to which one, it really doesn't make a difference. And until you have been working with tools for a long time, and I mean like years to decades, you're really not going to tell the difference unless you do a really specific head-to-head -head measurement. Um, you won't feel the difference. You might think you feel the difference, but the placebo effect is very, very strong when it comes to the steels. So, uh, general, do not overthink it. Um, it's not worth it. What was that look for? I wasn't giving a look. Yes, you were. You're always giving a look. <laughs> I usually deserve it. <laughs> Move on. Yeah, I mean, I'm just making fun of you, but okay. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, hand tool versus power tools. Um, I have a pile of videos on this one. Honestly, why are we arguing about this? If it's fun, do it. I mean, that's the whole purpose you're in the shop. Unless you are a production woodworker, and then there is no argument. You're using power tools most of the time, and then doing some of the final details with the hand tools. Um, if, you are, if you're doing it for a business, there is no argument about it. If you're doing it for a hobby, it's all about how much fun you're having, and who cares what you're using. If you see someone else that's doing it with a power tool method, do not poo-poo them. They're having fun. Let them do it. 
If you aren't having fun with the particular method you're using or the particular hand you, tool you're using, try something different. Try a power tool. Try something that makes it fun for you. And that's really what it's all about. So quit arguing or knocking people for using hand tools over power tools. That's just, that's something we need to remove. And that, that's one of the few things where I'll say there's a right and wrong to it. There's a wrong to say that one is better than the other um, in any particular function. Um, one may be faster than the other in one particular person or another, but that doesn't make them right or wrong. It's all about what do you want to use, and that's where it's right. Um, push saws and pull saws. Ah, this is one of my favorites. Western versus I'm Japanese. I'm sorry, anybody who had the volume turned up. Oh, I'm sorry. I got a little excited on that one. <laughs> yeah, got a couple videos on this one, All too. the time for that. Um, yes. Uh, okay. Is one better than the other? No. Does one have a better body mechanics than the other? No. Is one more efficient than the other? No. Uh, stating any one of those that one is better than the other, I can say indefinably. Indef indefinably? <laughs> I can say without a shadow of a doubt that saying that is wrong. Um, one of them is not more efficient than the other. One is not a better body mechanic than the other. They are two very different body mechanics. And you can physically be used to one or the other, or one works better for the way you are, or your bench height, or your shop setup, or the way your back and spine is curved. Um, they all have slightly different benefits to it. The big benefit is, with a Japanese saw, it cuts on the pull stroke. And that means the tooth that is leading the cut is on the opposite side of the work from you. You have no control over that side of the saw. You are on this side. So the leading tooth has nothing affecting it. So if your saw is set up well, and you set it up on that line, it will track a perfect line no matter what you're doing to it over here. And if you want to make it turn, it takes a lot of force, and you really have to make it want to turn. So for a beginner, this is phenomenal because it just goes through and cuts a really nice straight line. Very, very easy. Very affordable. You can pick these things up for almost nothing in comparison to what a lot of the Western saws are. When it comes to Western saws, um, yeah, this one's made by Jared Green. Uh, it's one of my new sash saws, and I've been having a lot of fun with it. With Western saws, the leading tooth is on my side of the board because I'm pushing it through. And that means that any slight movement in my hand will cause this to move. Any slight twist that I have will cause it to start cutting one way or the other. That means that I have more control over the saw. I can guide this very, very easily. If and I want it to turn a little bit, I want to bring it over into line, I can do that. If I didn't set it up perfectly at the beginning and it starts to go off course, no problem. I can bring it right back to where it should be. But the problem is that takes a lot of skill to do. And most of the people, when they're first getting going, have slightly bad body mechanic. And the saw is going to start going off over this way. And then they try to bring it back and they really crank it over and now it's going way over here. And then they start to do the zigzag, zigzag thing going back and forth because any slight movement, if your arm is slightly out of whack, your saw is going to start doing weird things. And so it's very, very easy to over control it. So this is hard to learn. But once you do learn it, you have more control. This is easy to learn, um, easy and quick to get going. But it tends to be a little bit less control. You have to put a lot more into it to get it to do the work. Um, is one better than the other? No. Um, it kind of comes down to body mechanic. You're going to find that you like the feel of one or the other. And great, use that. Um, there are a few people who like using both for different things. And there are a lot of people who don't like using both. It's usually one or the other. Um, so, yeah, experiment, play around, and have some fun with it. Did you want to say something? No, am I not allowed to look at you anymore? No, I'm just making, I'm giving you time. I'm taking a breath. Oh, okay. You're taking a breath. I'm I got taking you. A breath. I got you. No, just let me know when you're ready for questions. Okay. Um, strops versus high grit. This is a really, really common one. Um, and there is, I, I used to have a set of really nice high grit Shaptons that went up to, I think I had up to 16,000. Um, and, Whenever you're doing something with really high grit stones, you get this gorgeous polish. It's very, very easy to get a perfectly flat bevel. And you get this edge that just feels really, really good. Um, and going to the really high grits is an amazing feeling, and it works great. The problem is, in the actual functioning of how it cuts, it's not going to give you anything different than stopping at 1,000 grit and hitting a strop. Um, 
and this has been shown in test after test that I've done, is that if I really, really work at this and I take this edge all the way down to like a, an 80, which is really close to the absolute possible physical microscopic capability of this edge. Um, and for those of you who know, there's a, a sharpening system where you can actually measure the sharpness. And it measures it from zero to uh, like two to three thousand is basically a screwdriver. Um, and if you can get it down to a smaller number, it has a sharper, sharper edge. And steel, you can, if it's really good steel and set up perfectly and you get it down to the smallest molecule it will hold, you can get it down to about a 75. And if you're really, really careful and you do it up perfectly with a good shaft in, you can get that to like a, you can get really close to the 75, 80. Um, with a strop, I'm usually taking it to around 100, and I consider that to be golden. Um, anything below 100 is fine. The problem is, it really doesn't matter if you take it from that 100 down to the 80 or 70, because after a stroke or two, it's going to be right at about 100. Um, because that edge that you can get it down to disappears almost instantly. Uh, and test after test that I've done with this shows that it really doesn't make any difference. So saying that one of them will give you a better edge than the other for actual functional difference is absolutely wrong. They will both give you the exact same cutting edge. Um, the difference is a really high grit water stone um, feels fantastic. Uh, it, it's, it, there's, there's something that is just so pleasing about that gorgeous edge you get off it. You get a polish on there that is just absolutely amazing that you can kind of get with a strop, but it's just not the same as what you can get on a really high grit. The only difference there is feel though. A strop though is really fast and easy and usually I'm going to say go through a couple diamonds and go into the strop because it's, it's quick, it's easy, you don't think about it, it takes seconds, it's done. Uh, there's no mess to it, there's no cleanup. When you get into water stones, there's a lot of cleanup, there's a lot of mess, there's a lot of other issue with that. Um, and so, it's the, the, the plus and minus. Do you want that zen moment of sharpening? Do you want to really enjoy the moment of sharpening? In that case, high grit water stones are definitely the way to go, and that is definitely what I would recommend. If you don't want to mess with sharpening, you just want to get it done, diamond strop and done. Um, it's one of those things that's just, it's, it's fast, it's easy, it cuts really, really quickly. Diamonds cut so much quicker than any water stone. Um, they're just, they're efficient, but with efficiency you kind of lose that ah, je ne sais quoi, of the happiness, you know, that comes with the moment when something comes out, mm, it's happy. Um, okay, yeah, we'll drop that. <laughs> um, and so that from Oil to water stones to, to, to diamonds, it really is a personal preference. They will all get you the exact same edge in actual functionality. That, that makes no difference. Diamonds are a little faster. Water stones are a little bit more funky or a little bit more fun. Um, oil stones have their own appeal and that they're easier to get back to the wood. Um, there's less cleanup on an oil stone. There's a little more cleanup on a water stone. Um, I used to tell people when you're first getting into it, you're looking for a cheap um, thing. Um, get sandpaper, but um, after watching Rex's recent video on that um, and seeing some of the prices of uh, really cheap diamonds, don't get sandpaper. Uh, for almost the same price as getting a, a cheap setup of, of sandpaper, you can buy cheap diamonds that will last you far, far, far longer than the sandpaper will, um, and they will do a really, really good job. They won't last as long as a really good high-end diamond, um, but you know, for 20 bucks for a set of four, uh, you, you can't beat that. So if you're just getting into it and you're looking for the most cost-efficient way, a cheap set of diamonds is amazing now. Um, five, six years ago, I would have told you otherwise, but now the prices have been coming down and the, the methods of making them have become far more common. Um, diamonds are the, 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 the cheapest way right now. Um, but if you're going to be doing it for a while, I'd say, you know, get a good set of diamonds. They will last you longer um, and they're a little bit easier to work with because you get a full plate rather than just a thin crisp of them. Um, but in all honesty, they're all going to cut you the exact same edge. One will look a little bit different, but after a stroke or two in the wood, they will all get you to the exact same sharpness. So don't overthink it. Okay, since you're on that topic. Okay.
is there a particular brand you recommend for the cheaper ones or are you going to put a link in the um for the cheaper ones i'm going to tell you go take a look at rex's video he, he did just like uh three weeks ago on that um, he has a link to some i actually haven't had a chance to get them um it's one of those things where i don't often deal in the most cost efficient way to do things i love rex do that i focus on the fun of woodworking and so i'm always looking for the most enjoyable way to do it uh, Rex, in his channel, he's always looking for the most cost-effective way. Um, he is the affordable woodworker, um, so go take a look at his channel on that. Um, but yeah, there, there's there's a bunch of different makers of those now, and there, there's um, plates that are like uh, they're like six inches by three or four inches. Um, they're not quite as long as these, but they're a little wider and they're much thinner. Um, but you can get them on AliExpress. You can get them several places on Amazon, um, and it's usually like. Uh, 20, 25 bucks, shipping included, for um, the price of four plates. Um, but yeah, I should get a set of those and, and, and put links to them. I just haven't had a chance to do that yet. Uh, is that another super chat? Yes, from Sumi. Oh, I'll, I'll let him do. What, what is he going to say? How do you know when your diamonds are done and you need a new plate? Uh, that's actually um, a hard thing because they, are, they, they go out so slowly that you really can't feel the difference. Um, but one of the problems that a lot of people have with diamonds is that they, they wear in very, very quickly. Um, and so if you get a new plate, especially with the really coarse stones, the, the, the coarse and extra coarse are incredibly fast right off the bat. And like three or four strokes and you're grinding off the steel just in, incredibly fast. Um, and then after sharpening for a few weeks to a month, um, they're not doing that as more. And you start to think, well, are they wearing out? No, no, they're just actually mellowing into what they will be. Um, because the way it works is all of these diamonds are embedded in um, a nickel plate or a, a chrome plating. Um, and the ones that aren't embedded really well get knocked off and they start rolling away. And so there's a lot of big ones that are sticking up that are really aggressive that will be taking off a lot of material. Well, if they're big and they're sticking up, they're probably going to be the first ones to be knocked off. Um, and so they usually mellow out in the first couple weeks to a couple months, depending upon how often you sharpen. Uh, even the cheap plates, you can generally expect to get at least a year to two out of them. Um, I, I would be very surprised if they, they wear out faster than that. Um, the good ones, most of the time people are going to tell you you can get a decade or more out of them. Um, and so I, like my DMTs, I love them. Um, and it used to be that they were the ones that you, you don't buy anything but that because they were the only ones who had mastered the, the skill of actually getting them on there very well. Uh, but now several other companies have gotten into that. Um, how do you actually tell, though, if, if you are spending, like, if the edge of the steel is moderately sharp but you want to clean it up and you take it to the medium stone, and it takes more than seven to 10 passes to get you right back to where you were, to get a burr turned over on it, um, then you might want to think about it. Um, it's, yeah, that's about where I put it. Um, but it's really hard to tell you <laughs> what, they, what they are. If you're, if you're sharpening and it's taking forever to do it, um, then yeah, you might need to replace them. <laughs> or what you could do is buy a set of the cheap ones and then just compare them every now and then and have something you can check against. Like, this is taking forever. Well, do I take it over here? Oh yeah, that's taking forever. I guess I just needed to spend more time on this edge. Um, <laughs> and yeah, have something to reference against might help you out with that. But yeah, it's one of those things that's really, really hard to tell. Um, yeah, and I ha actually, my, my set here are the same set I've been using for over seven years now. Um, and they're, they're still going strong, so I'm, I'm interested to see how long they last. I've gotten a couple cheaper ones that I've worn out, um, but I'm loving those, so, yeah. Uh, next. Ooh, oh, this is a good one. Nib on the saw. What is the nib on the saw? And I actually don't have a saw with a nib on it right now. Um, I actually just uh, gave away um, two of them that had nibs, and I was going to use one, but I don't have it anymore. So what it is, um, it used to be that the, the saws would have this little nib right up here near the, the nose of the saw. Um, and this is one that we, we actually know what it was there for. And that really surprises a lot of people because there are lots of arguments about this. 
and there will be forever because it's one of those things that's really kind of counterintuitive to some people and they just don't want to believe it. But yes, we do know the actual reason why the nib is there. And the nib is there because someone put it there. Okay, next. Um, <laughs> no, um, honestly, the reason it's there is the same reason that a lot of the other ornamentation is on the saw handle and other things and why there is a sway in the back. Uh, it's there as ornamentation. The more detail you put into the saw, the more the person buying it knew that you cared about this saw and you had the skill to put that detail in because you can tell the difference between a quality sawmaker and a cheap sawmaker nowadays by just looking at the handle because a good saw has extra detail in it. Let me give you an idea here. This one, here, grab this and this. Okay, here are three different saws that have all been made in eh, the last few decades. So. Let me move this over so you can actually see. Oh, I didn't turn that on. That would help. Oh, shoot. I didn't plug it in either. <laughs> that would be something more. Um, so one of these saws is a new one from Jared Green uh, that I just got last week. And it is out of focus. This one here. Okay, so let me show you this. This is a gorgeous, gorgeous handle. Um, really really smooth polish on it extra little details here extra little details here extra little details here I and mean, look at that in there this handle spent a lot of time on this um, and you can tell these details have absolutely no physical use there is no reason to put in these extra little details here but yet they're there why so you can tell the difference in quality between that and a pack saw. A pack saw is a much, much cheaper saw, but it doesn't have any of these details. It was just run around by a router. Now, it is a little bit better than some. Like, uh, here, let me bring this. This is an old, uh, not an old, this is a newer Distin. And you can tell the pack saw has even more details than this. This one just has these slotted nuts. These have these, uh, these split nuts. And so you can kind of tell some of the little things that make a saw better just by its quality. And the nib on the saw was that. It was ornamentation. Um, you will hear some people say, oh, that was to help start a cut. Fooey, that is absolutely just one of the dumbest things because, I mean, honestly, if you have the quality, if you had the skill to use a saw, you know how to start a cut. You don't need something dumb to start a cut with one rounded tooth. Um, you'll hear some people say, ooh, that was to hold a cover on the saw so you could have something to latch onto on the other side. Uh, historically, covers on saws didn't exist. You put them in a box. Um, there wasn't a cover on the saw. Now, others would say, ooh, that was to use to hang it up. Uh, no, you, you, you put them in a box or they would hang on the horn. Uh, you wouldn't hang anything on there. It was, it was a delicate thing. And some of the really old ones, you'd actually see three or four nibs and each one would be progressively more ornate. You could tell by the quality of the saw what the nib was. It had no functional use, just like all the other little details would. It was ornamentation. Um, and yes, that is actually documented from saw makers in the past saying our saws are better because we can have a more ornate nib on there. It has no function. But for some reason, people have this mindset that it has to have a function because no one would make something that wouldn't have function. <laughs> but you look at all the saws and they're all covered with things that spent a lot of time to make that have absolutely no function. So, yeah, um, we know why the nib was there. And it was there for ornamentation. It has no function. I'm sorry. <laughs> but yeah, that is one I can definitely say, yes, we know why the nib was there. You're not sorry. Um, JS Chucking, what did he say? Chucking. Um, I just watched your video building those two purple heart slash Ashley hand planes. Where did you get the blade steel from? Purple heart Ashley hand planes? Is it supposed to be just ash? Purple heart and ash? Did it auto put in ashes? Oh, 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 that was a long time ago. That was like seven years ago. Uh, what was the question? He, where did I get the... Where did you get your blade 
steal from? Oh, um, that was actually just on Amazon. Yeah. Um, uh, it was quarter inch thick 01, uh, yeah, 01 tool steel. Um, yeah, I just bought it on Amazon. You can actually get it annealed and grind it. I just searched Amazon for 01 steel, quarter inch thick, I think it was two inch wide. Um, and I bought a foot of it and cut it down into chunks for a couple different blades. Um, you can also get McMaster car, and there's a whole bunch of places where you can buy 01, A2. They're very, very common. Um, yeah, no, I forgot about that. That was a really cool plane. I should do another one like that. It was a fun build. Um, I actually, I'm starting in on a um, an infill plane. I'm, uh, I'm restarting it, and I've started it three times now. Uh, of doing a brass side with a stainless steel bottom, dovetailed um, infill. <sighs> I've been working on that one for well, about six months now. Still got a lot more to do on it. <laughs> I'm trying to picture this now. I'm What's that? Trying to picture some mic issues. Mic issues? I'm probably yelling. <laughs> um, Just clipping if I go too loud. Bad audio things happening. Hopefully. What's that? I don't know why all of a sudden we're having audio. Hopefully it's better now. Um, yeah, if it's not, let me know. You have one more thing to talk about, right? Like touching the mic noise. Is it James or me? Where's so your, your mic on yours? Loud static. Where's your mic on yours? Mine's right here. I, it turns so I can see. Is it tucked underneath there? Because if it's rubbing on the on the, the thing, it'll be there. Um. Okay. Um. I have one more thing on the list, then we'll get to, to questions on here. So if you have questions or things you want me to address, those on there. Uh, the last one, this is a common one that I get comments on constantly. And that is, um, usually, when I set a plane down, I set it down flat on the bench. Oh no, I dropped it. Oh no, I dropped it. Again. Oh no, and that just drives people bonkers. Um, because they're, they're worried that I'm going to be ruining the edge. Um, and my iron is actually sticking out right now as I would normally have it for cutting. It's sticking out a hundredth of an inch or so. And did I destroy the edge? No. <laughs> it's, it didn't hurt this plane in the slightest bit. Um, the, the big problem is that a lot of people were taught during uh, shop classes that they need to keep the plane on its side so you don't hurt the edge. And there is some wisdom to that, but very, very little. And that was something that um, historically speaking, before like 1900, just didn't exist. Um, people would just set the plane down. Um, usually you would either have a track that you'd set the nose on if you were worried about that, or you'd set it on some wood chips, or you just set it down. Uh, it wasn't something you really worried about. Can you check your cable? They say it sounds like it's like a loose wire. Here, let me check something over here. Um, and so shop teachers would, would yell at students. Let's see. Oh, there it goes. Huh. Must be hitting something. See, you try blaming me. Yeah, I don't know. We'll see how it goes. <laughs> Stop flailing. <laughs> I got the talk with my arms. Um, Shop teachers would yell at students if they didn't put them on their sides. And that just became embedded into several uh, generations of woodworkers that if you didn't have it on your side, you were doing it wrong. And in all honesty, it's, it's kind of dumb when you think about it because you're, you're not going to hurt the iron from setting it down on the iron. It, it's just not going to cause uh, any issue to it. It's, it's designed to go into wood. Um, <laughs> It's really kind of one of those things that doesn't make much sense. And if you do put it up on its side, now you're exposing the iron. So anything that happens to slide by uh, will damage the iron. And usually the things sliding by are made of metal or they're made of flesh. And uh, that just is honestly dangerous. Um, so I would propose that having it on its side is actually the least... Uh, it's the less, um, it, it's better to have it flat than just to have it outside. Um, and if you go back and look at a lot of the historical books and things from, you know, pre-1910, uh, you're going to find that most woodworkers 
head on the bench. Look a lot of the old drawings, they were flat on the bench. Um, and I know the argument then is most of the time they were then wooden bodies and so they were lighter so they wouldn't put as much damage into it. But, you know, I, I, don't, I don't see that. And I would love to do a test on that actually sometime and actually um, compare the two and, you know, set one five times down on a bench and see if it gets duller. Um, but I haven't quite figured out exactly how to do that. So that'd be a fun test to do in the future. But yeah, um, that's kind of a new thing that was that came about from the um, the, the shop class um, generation as opposed to uh, historical actual this is better than that. So yeah, is one better than the other? Ah, whatever. Uh, is there a problem with putting it outside? No. Is there a problem with putting it on a sole? No. Whichever you prefer. Let's have fun. So what other things we got? I'm just trying to think through that argument for a second. I'm like, is it so they know if someone was playing with it, if it wasn't on its side? <laughs> uh, the, the, the common thought is that the shop teacher was the one who sharpened irons. And so the shop teacher didn't want them setting it down on top of other things. And so if they're going to put it on the bench to put it on its side, even though it happened to fall on top of other things, it still protected it. It'd be better than putting it down on top of a chisel. Um, but as long as you're putting it on the bench, I, I, I don't see a reason for that argument. Hmm. But yeah, it was one of those odd things that you didn't hear about until shop teachers came around. And then there's this whole generation that were taught, you never, ever, 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 ever set it down on its soul. You always keep it on its side. And they were quite often literally yelled at in shop class for that. And so it kind of became ingrained into it that that's just something that's wrong to do. Can you tell James was an ever in shop class? Yeah. Um, Paul Sellers actually has a really phenomenal video on that where he goes into um, the, comp the comparison and, and talking through the history on it. So it's kind of an interesting one to look at. What do we got? Oh, I forgot to put a time on this one. Hmm. I'll have to go back. Uh, let's see. Alex wants to know, who is a better woodworker, James or Sarah? Sarah. Yeah. <laughs> it's Sarah. We'll just let it go at that. <laughs> hey. I actually picked up a copy of Popular Woodworking and was browsing today. I was like, what I was has actually really happened to that. me? What <laughs> has happened to me? And I, and I actually knew half of what they were talking about. That was even <laughs> stranger. Why don't you give me the next question when you look at that? Okay, show. hang on. Um, sorry, I was trying to timestamp something. Who super chatted? Troy J. Looking for a mom joke. Missing out since I haven't been able to as frequently as I'd like. <laughs> well, thanks, Troy. Thanks. I hope you like this one. Why don't you, you have one ready? I have one ready. Oh, you're ready. What is a cat's favorite sports car? What? A Ferrari. <laughs> uh, what came to mind is what's a, a cat's favorite shoe company? Parada. I like it. That was a good one. <laughs> yes, we do dad and mom jokes when y'all aren't here too. <laughs> All right. Uh, Aaron Fenn, honest question. What is a better, what is the better smoother, a three or a four? Um, I kind of talked to it before. Better, uh, they each have their own things. A three will allow you to spot clean areas a little bit better. Um, whereas a four tends to be the more common desired of uh, the average woodworker as a smoother. Um, yeah, uh, th that's just a personal preference thing. That really is what it comes down to is which one do you want to use? Most of the time if I'm smoothing, I'm gonna grab the four. But there are times when I just wanna hit that spot and then I grab a card scraper. <laughs> I heard you talking about the four. I couldn't remember you saying anything about the three. Huh? Um, let's see, Ken Carlisle, should I hunt for a quarter hollow molding plane or combination plane cutter or should I just use a power router and round over and round over bit to make trim? 
Do I need to read that again? Um, well, it, that's, that's something that just comes down to personal choice. I mean, which one do you want to do? Um, yeah, uh, most of the time, if you have a specific molding that you want, it's just going to be quicker to get the router bit that matches it and run it um, because finding a specific molding um, plane is kind of difficult um, unless you get like a 55 that has all the cutters and then you're going to be spending the same price as you'd spend on you know, five or six routers. Um, and 55s are a, a, a pain to set up for something like that. Um, but if you do have a set of hollows and hollows and rounds, it goes pretty easily. It really just comes down to uh, which one do you want to do? Um, yeah, is one better than the other? No. Um, yeah, six of one if it does with another. <laughs> What's next? Uh, let's see. Anaphylaxis wants to know, what is the best smoothing plane for the money? She's looking for brand. Um, okay, that depends on you. The cheapest one that you can that will work for you with a little bit of setup uh, in my book right now is the Tay Tools. Um, it, it, you really can't beat that price. And it's a decent plane. It's going to take a little bit of setup. It's not perfect right out of the box. Um, and I've got a video showing actually setting one up like that. And for the money, that's, that's the best one on the market. Um, however, if you want the, f the best one for the money that will work straight out of the box, uh, you're probably going to look at Wood River. Um, you may want to look at the Stanley Sweetheart series. Uh, both of those, I would, I would put the Wood River a little bit above the Stanley Sweetheart. Um, Stanley Sweetheart don't have quite the fit and finish that the Wood River do, um, but that would be the the next um, big jump. There are a few others in that list, but those would be the main ones I'd hit. So it kind of depends on you. What do you want to put into it as to what do you expect out of the box? Is that one known from Trucking and Guitars? Yes. Uh, what's your opinion on the Faithful brand pan planes? Um, they're good, yeah. I mean, they're not the best in the world, um, but for a general user, they're phenomenal. Um, they're, they're really, really good. Um, I actually used to have one, but I think I've sold that one. Yeah. So, yeah, they're, they're good. Um, basically, if, if you had a hand plane that was made before 1960, it's a good hand plane. Um, they're, they're, I mean, there were a few cheap ones, but they didn't last, um, and they're, they're not around. They were they were used in scrap drives, um, and they don't exist. Uh, so if, it was, if it's older than 1960, it's a good user. There, there really isn't any way to get around that. As long as all the parts are there and you can clean it up and function it, it's, it's a good user. Um, so fit and finish is the, is the big difference. It's the same thing it is now. It's fit and finish is the difference between a good user and a really nice plane. It's just how it feels in your hand and how much work it's going to take to get up and going. What's next? Technically, it's time for a mom joke. Uh, do you have a question before I do that? or No. What have we got? Ready? Yeah. Do you know why the cross-eyed teacher lost her job? Why? She couldn't control her pupils. Yes, okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we have follow-up. This jointer is brand new. From JS A Trump. new faithful? Yes. I don't think faithful. I played with this. I'm going to have to look that up, man. Tell you what, send me an email and I'll take a look at it. Um, yeah, I don't know. I... I don't know that particular one. It's, it's probably um, because there's a factory in China that makes hand planes for a whole bunch of the low-end planes. Um, Tay Tools, most of the ones you're going to see on Amazon, Amazon Basics, um, they're all made out of the same factory. And the interesting thing about that factory is you, get, you don't get the exact same plane from all of them. There is the, it, it's, um, the same body but then you're going to get all of these different things that you can upgrade to in different knobs and different connections. And um, some of those things will make it a functional plane and some of them make it total trash. Uh, so it really depends on how much money the particular buyer wanted to put into making it a good plane. Uh, but I don't know particularly on that faithful one. I'll have to look that up. Yeah, I don't know. I'll have to look that up. 
What's next? Uh, let's see. Got six minutes left. Uh, yeah. Aaron, then, um, when you were talking about Japanese versus um, Western saws, was then wanting to know your opinion of Japanese versus American chisels. Um, I have them in the chisel test if you want to see that. Um, in the actual use and function, it's just a personal thing. Uh, the most important thing about a chisel is not the quality of steel. It's not the shape or the edge or the way it's designed. It is its feel. How does it work for your style? How does it feel in your hand? Because you're holding it in many different ways. How do you hold it? How do you use it? Um, and the, the feel of the chisel is the most important aspect of it, way more than the steel quality or what's in that. Um, and so Japanese steel, Japanese chisels are a very different thing. Um, number one, the handle is out of line with the blade, so it can be flush, so you can use it as a chisel plane. Cool feature, but the problem is then the handle is like tipped this way, so when you're pounding it, there's always a little bit of force going this way. I personally don't like that, but I know a lot of people who really do like that. Um, so it just kind of comes down to a personal preference. Um, is one better than the other? No. Um, if, if you're the type of person where you're always flattening the back and really making sure the back is pristine, Japanese are really easy because it makes it very easy to flatten it. It's hollowed out. But then you're also going to have to do some uh, occasional tapping to get it put back into place so they do take more effort to use. Um, and so really it just comes down to personal per preference. I don't like them because I don't like the bent handle. Um, I don't like the hollowed out back. I find that to be rather annoying in general use. Um, and I don't like the idea of the, the tapping them out. Um, so yeah, just a regular Western style for me, but personal preferences. What's next? We need to know the answer to the wax question. Is there a wax question? Put the wax question back in there. We'll take a look at it. What's next while we're waiting for that? Okay. Um, Nicholas Todd had asked, what is the difference between plate sizes of panel saws? Is it personal or is there a reason? Plate sizes of panel saws? Um, the bigger the plate, the longer the stroke you can put onto it. Um, they're usually pretty closely associated to teeth. Um, with a panel saw, it's a panel saw is things 24 inches and shorter. Oh. Um, and so generally with a panel saw, you're gonna have slightly smaller teeth. And that's kind of the mid-range saw. Um, the, the larger hand saws have, have a, like a 26 to 28 inch. Um, and those ones tend to have very large teeth, like four PPI, five PPI. Uh, those ones tend to be pretty strictly just rip. Um, so you can do large heavy duty cuts. Uh, whereas most of the smaller ones tend to be cross cut because that's where you're gonna be using them more is your, basically your large cross cuts are small panel saws. But, yeah. What was that? <laughs> so the answer to the wax question is whether you polish your head with hard wax or soft wax. Oh, neither. It's, it's uh, homemade boiled linseed oil. I mean, this is the, <laughs> that was the only thing to wax a head with is just oil. Don't need no stinking beeswax mixed in there. <laughs> Got enough time for one more? Hair Care by James. Yes. Bestseller. <laughs> <laughs> I need to do that. Make a, a bald head wax. And then you pop up with a Bob Ross wig. <laughs> <laughs> or hair growth gel. Yeah, that's what I mean. <laughs> uh, okay, Richard Buckman. If you bend one of the diamond plates, is it worth trying to flatten them again or get new ones? Um... I mean, if you if you if you kink it, you get a new one. Um, if, if, if they're flexible to bend like that, then they're 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 cheap enough to replace. Um, but if if it's just like a gradual bend, well then bend it back the other way. They are, they are made of a fairly flexible surface. Although most of the time people are going to glue them down to a hard surface rather than keeping them flat. Um, um, Rex actually has a, a video doing that using contact cement. Works really well. Just get a flat piece of um, plywood and smoke them down and you're good to go. Smoke them down. You yeah. heard it here, folks. <laughs> <laughs> so I think that will about do it. Um, if you have any questions that I didn't get to, feel free to send me a message and we'll address this some other time. Uh, not sure what we're doing next week. Is the, it Q&A? We'll probably be doing yeah. the, the, the monthly Q&A next week because the week after that, 
Uh, we probably won't be doing a live. We will be out of town. Probably. I am on vacay. I love y'all, but I'm on vacay. Yeah, we'll be in Juneau, Alaska then. So probably won't be doing a live. <laughs> so on that note, I think that'll do it for now. And until next time, have a wonderful day. Bye. Bye.